For the last two years, I've been showing you how much our current government in Washington, D.C. is acting exactly as King George III did back in the 18th century. While well, King George's actions led the colonies to declare independence, the states have not shown themselves as willing to defend their rights and those of their citizens now. Why is that? I think the answer can be found in the Declaration of Independence. All experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Could it be that all of the evils coming out of the federal government are still sufferable? Are the people willing to suffer the ruling of judges, the monarchical actions of the president, and Congress acting more like a House of Lords than the representative body was created to be? Apparently they are. How long will this trend of abuses have to grow before we throw out those in this tyrannical government and restore not only our independence, but justice and liberty as well? What will it take for us to learn the truth of what Abraham Lincoln said? We, the people, are the rightful masters of both Congress and the courts, not to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow the men who pervert the Constitution. The phrase, disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable, reminds me of New York City in the late 80s and early 90s. When my family moved out of the city in 1975, things were bad. Times Square was a drug-infested cesspool. 42nd Street was full of prostitutes, and well, there were parts of Central Park where families just didn't walk. For 20 years after we left, things only got worse. The people kept electing the same type of representation to city government probably because their evils were still sufferable. Finally, they had enough and elected someone with a different way of governing, Rudy Giuliani. As mayor, Mr. Giuliani changed how the police treated crime, how the city provided services, and how the people viewed the city. This led to a renaissance for the city with lower crime, cleaner subways, and more tourism. The examples of people righting themselves by fixing their government First by declaring themselves independent from Great Britain, and then by New York City electing a different type of mayor, should be an example to us today. As recent elections have shown, people in this country appear more willing to suffer evil than to right themselves. Yet I fear the unrest of those who are unwilling to suffer any more under the tyrannical acts coming out of Washington, D.C. I fear one day it will lead some to do more than alter our form of government, but to abolish it altogether. Let's back up a minute. Through the 1760s and 1770s, the colonists suffered many injustices at the hand of King George and the British Parliament. They tried to negotiate with their tormentors, but to no avail. On the few occasions when Parliament relented, they simply replaced one injustice with another. The colonies sent delegates to their Continental Congress for several reasons, among them to find relief from British oppression. Finally, it became obvious to at least one of the delegates, Richard Henry Lee from Virginia, that enough was enough. He proposed that the colonies declare independence. Resolved that these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. While the delegates conferred with their colonies about the Lee Resolution, it was apparent that the resolution would pass. Therefore, the Continental Congress formed the Committee of Five to draft a statement for when that happened. The opening paragraph of the Declaration of Independence explains its purpose. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. The committee consisted of John Adams of Massachusetts, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Robert R. Livingston of New York, and Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, who drafted the document. 
Once the committee agreed on the language, it went to the full Congress for final changes and publication. In many ways, the states today are in a similar situation to the colonies in 1776. For years, the government of the United States has not only been infringing on the rights of the people, but on the states as well, though there are some very significant differences. Most significant of all is that the states are sovereign, while the colonies were not. So while the colonies were creations of the British government, the states had declared themselves free and independent, then fought and won a war to confirm it. The colonies, including their governments, were formed with charters under the British crown, while the states were formed by the people and the governments created by their own constitutions. Furthermore, the states created the government of the United States when they ratified its constitution. As the progenitor of the United States, the states not only hold themselves sovereign above their creation, but only subjected themselves to the powers they had delegated to it. From the Tenth Amendment we read, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. This means when the colonies declared themselves independent, they were committing a rebellion, which Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines as, an open and avowed renunciation of the authority of the government to which one owes allegiance. However, when the states stand up against the overreach of the government of the United States, not only is this not a rebellion, insurrection, or treason, but the support of the supreme law of the land. From Article 6, Clause 2 of the Constitution, This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. As such, both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison recognized not only the power of the states to rein in the United States government, but it's, they saw it as their duty. As James Madison wrote in the Virginia Resolutions, that this assembly doth explicitly and peremptorily declare that it views the powers of the federal government as resulting from the compact to which the states are parties, as limited by the plain sense and intention of the instrument constituting that compact, as no farther valid than they are authorized by the grants enumerated in that compact, and in the case of a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the said compact, the states, who are parties thereto, have the right and are duty-bound to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. In the face of all this, why do the states remain under the thumb of the government in Washington, D.C., when it goes beyond its legitimate powers? I believe there are several reasons, including both a poor civics education and a serious lack of backbone. On the rare occasions, when the Constitution is taught in schools, they teach around the document and not what it actually says. They cover some of the names and the dates, even a little of what it does, but they don't teach what the Supreme Law of the Land actually says. Even law schools teach judicial opinions rather than the Constitution. I've asked dozens of attorneys if, while in law school, did they study the Constitution or constitutional law. Over the years, I have been performing this informal poll. Only one person has said they studied the Constitution. The rest studied the opinion of judges, euphemistically called constitutional law. Since so many politicians start out as lawyers, or at least have an education from a law school, is it any wonder they know little of what the document they take an oath to support actually says? Let's face it, as much as it may make our skin crawl to consider it, politicians are human. That means they naturally tend to do all they can to avoid pain. Why should a politician stand up and support a position unpopular with their peers? After all, it's not like the people they represent would be willing to stand beside them, is it? Why should any politician buck their party leadership if the people they represent are more likely to vote for whomever their party prefers? We the people have effectively removed the spine of anyone who makes it to high elected office by teaching them throughout their political career that the way to get reelected is to say the right things and keep the checks and programs flowing. When was the last time you asked a candidate when they supported the Constitution and it cost them something? If we don't make constitutional fidelity as a standard for elective office, why should those in office? It appears that Americans today are willing to suffer much more than our predecessors. 
As I've documented over the last two Independence Days, the grievances we have today against Washington, D.C. not only match, but far exceed those the colonists had against the Crown in 1776. Yet here we are, disposed to suffer. The colonies were abolishing their form of government, yet in American day, all we need to do is alter those in government. Yet even that seems to be too much for we the people. Instead, election after election, we keep doing the same thing, hoping against hope that this time it will be different. That was Einstein's definition of insanity. Perhaps it's not the patriot, the constitutional scholar, or the one fighting for their rights that's crazy. Perhaps it's the rest of the country blindly placing their hope in some individual to free them from this doom. Maybe it's just that the evils have not gotten evil enough for us to oppose them. Could it be that we the people have become so enfeebled by our dependence on government that we prefer subjugation to liberty? George Washington warned us about this in his 1796 farewell address. The disorders and miseries which result gradually incline the minds of men to seek security and repose in the absolute power of an individual. And sooner or later, the chief of some prevailing faction, more able or more fortunate than his competitors, turns this disposition to the purposes of his own elevation and the ruins of public liberty. So here we are, another Independence Day. Yet we seem to be doing nothing to right the ship. I can only conclude that the American people are willing to suffer these evils rather than stand up and change things. I know, it's a big deal. Jefferson said that changing the way we do our government is not a mild thing. It's not something we do lightly. I know, Jefferson said, altering your government is not an easy thing. It's not something to be done lightly. But we're not altering our government. We're not even abolishing our government. What we're really talking about is altering the people in our government. Giving them a reason to actually follow the Constitution rather than their political party and their special interest groups. I know it's not easy. And I know a, a few people don't seem to make a big difference in the rest of the world. But you know what I've found in, in traveling this country and talking to people who truly want to make a difference? You don't have to change the whole country. You only have to change what's right in front of you. In the Bible, in the book of Nehemiah, when he rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem, he didn't rebuild the whole wall. People in groups built the wall that was right in front of them, and they joined them together and raised it up. That's what we should be doing here. I don't have to fix the entire country. I just have to fix what's right in front of me. My neighbors in, in, in this county, we don't need to fix Washington, D.C. We just need to fix what's right in front of us, the county that we live in. And if we do this here and you do it where you are, and others join us, we start making a difference. We start spreading those seeds of freedom and liberty. I know we want the bomb. We want the big pass. We want the big move that makes a tremendous difference. Those rarely work out well. It's the slow, incremental changes that make a long-lasting difference. It's why I formed the Constitution Study Patriots. We just had our first boot camp. And it's there to give us a foundation in order to build our arguments and build our programs. And the Patriots are there to help. To provide education, communication, and people who are ready to be active. Will you consider joining us? You don't have to do everything. Can you do something? Go to constitutionstudy.com slash patriots. If you haven't been through the boot camp, take the boot camp. It's absolutely free. If the video is not quite up yet, I apologize. I'm still editing it. But take it. Follow the boot camp. Take the test. Sign the pledge. And then join us as patriots. And if you can fix a little bit of what's right in front of you, and I can fix a little bit of what's right in front of me, who knows? Maybe in a couple of years, rather than going on again about how we're just like the colonies in 1776, we can start talking about the differences that we're making and how we are restoring liberty and justice for all in this country. I can't do it alone. I need your help. So I'm calling you to join me by becoming a Constitution Study Patriot.
I also hope you come back next time and maybe even bring a friend or two to the Constitution study. Love the neighbors and have a few good friends every day.